Okay, Jules Evans, thank you for joining the Parallax podcast. Uh, thank you, Tom. A few words. A few words. You're a writer and you're a philosopher. Uh, you can be found at the webpage philosophyforlife.org and you wrote a couple of books, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, as well as The Art of Losing Control. Uh, were there more than those two books? or? Um, I co-edited a book on spiritual emergencies called Breaking Open, uh, Finding a Way Through Spiritual Emergency, co-edited with Tim Reed. Yeah, and then... In the last year or so, I'm the, I'm the director of the Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Project. So I'm, I guess, um, the connection to the paper we're going to discuss is that I'm interested. Uh, I, 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 I'm interested in the history of ideas, um, and I'm interested in uh, critical spirituality. Right. So having, you know, going beyond just dismissal of spirituality, but also like total love and light uh, type spirituality and recognizing that, you know, for example, ecstatic experiences and mystical or, or psychedelic experiences can sometimes be messy and difficult. Uh, and that you need to think about the cultural and ethical container for ecstatic and psychedelic experiences and the risks of harm, including ethical harm, like ego inflation, cultishness, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, I think we'll, we'll get to this. So I, I um, read your paper. Um, it floated around on the internet. I don't exactly know where I got it. So it's called uh, More Evolved Than You. Is that right? And so you presented, yeah. uh, you presented some ideas in regard of uh, uh, evolutionary spirituality. And you pointed out five fallacies or, or pathological aspects of it. Before we get to this, yeah. can you um, shortly explain, just for, for introduction, what, what do you mean with evolutionary spirituality, so that, that we can start off there? Sure. Um, you can talk about the kind of... So in the last century, uh, and today still, there have been uh, particularly kind of after Darwin, uh, new forms of religion or spirituality emerged, which um, presented themselves as kind of evolutionary spiritualities. Um, one, so we could talk about, you know, because there is a history also before Darwin that they emerged out of, but um, particularly um, after Darwin as well. And um, there are lots of varieties of them. You could talk about the ideas of, you know, Herbert Spencer, uh, Nietzsche's cult of the Ubermensch, um, Bergson's philosophy, Henri Bergson. You could talk about Jan Smuts's philosophy of holism. You could talk about Ernst Haeckel's ideas of monism, uh, psychical research, integral yoga, Sri Aurobindo, different forms of theosophy, Uh, and then after World War II, you could talk about the human potential movement, uh, transhumanism, um, and and also uh, you know it's, it's some some movements that call themselves uh, evolutionary spirituality, particularly you know since the 80s. What all these diverse movements have in common um, is is two main ideas. First of all, um, that the religion of the future will be a synthesis of science and spirituality, that you can bring science and spirituality into a kind of marriage. And that's the future for the human race. And then secondly, that the kind of bedrock of this, of this religion of the future will be evolution. And that you can guide evolution towards um, higher and better forms. Um, Often, you know, they will use um, these different evolutionary spiritualities will use different words or phrases for this higher, these higher kind of types of human. Um, so they might talk about homo deus or the transhuman or the ubermensch or the new man or the future human. Or they might talk about a, a higher state or perhaps collective state of consciousness or of evolution. Uh, the supermind, or superintelligence, or the singularity, or the new sphere, for example. Um, 
And they might have different ideas about how this evolutionary advance to this next stage will happen. Um, often these evolutionary forms of spirituality, well, so they might talk about traditional Darwinian forms, like through kind of uh, survival and reproduction. They might talk about steering evolution through things like eugenics or genetic modification. And quite often these forms of evolutionary spirituality have a kind of Lamarckian view of evolution. Like if you attain a certain kind of often state of mind or state of consciousness, um, like cosmic consciousness, for example, this will somehow shift the entire species to a new level. So that's quite, a, you know, because traditional Darwinism, it just happens through, um, through, you know, inheritance, through genes. But often these forms of evolutionary spirituality think, you know, if I attain to a state of, of, of peak consciousness or self-actualization, this will somehow shift the whole species. Um, so that's, that's, that's roughly what okay, I Okay, mean. so let me, let me jump right in there. Um, it's a two-part question. The first part is, so, so if you look at uh, evolutionary spirituality and you outlined more or less its contents, right? or its structure. So what, yeah. what is it then? Is it a worldview? Is it a meme? Like in itself, is uh -huh. it like Peter Sloterdijk, the German philosopher would call a practice system? How, how would you frame evolutionary spirituality itself? And the uh -huh. second part of the question would be, is it in itself a faulty frame or worldview? Is it because you right. already uh, treat it in your description as something that is somewhat arbitrary. I don't know about um, arbitrary, but I suppose one criticism could be that I've, you know, the, I've included in this, in this term, in this group, quite different um, types of philosophy or religion. Um, for example, I mean, Henri Bergson's ideas, he, you know, he talks about creative evolution but he presents himself as a philosopher. This is a philosophy, even though it was a quasi-religious philosophy. Whilst there are other things within this category um, which much more explicitly presented themselves as religions, like theosophy, for example. Right. So I think the way to think about it is, is you know, in that idea of family resemblances. Right. Mm -hmm. And these are, and, and, and what that family has in common are those two ideas I mentioned. First of all, that you can bring in science and spirituality into a new kind of synthesis. And secondly, that you can guide evolution towards higher forms, higher and better forms. And that this is somehow... Now, what, what how I think of them is really, they are kind of science religions. Uh, or you can call them substitute religions. So there's one historian of ideas, who, who um, Jonathan Rose, who referred to them as substitute religions. Um, there's another philosopher, Mary Midgley, who wrote a book called Evolution is a Religion. So, in, you know, these are kinds of, these are amalgams. They're both often, you know, scientific, but they're also religious. They're prophetic because they're saying, this is, this is the destiny of the human race. Uh, and for, for, for many of the people within this, this, this broad kind of movement, this is, um, it's, it's both a, a, a kind of quasi-scientific way of thinking, but it's also um, a religious way of thinking. Right. But my question still is, if you think that the general idea of some sort of ascension, if that is a, if that is a misguided one, or if you okay. could find approach to this way where you find some value in it. It is not my aim to dismiss evolutionary spirituality right. in its entirety. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, well, okay, first of all, let's talk about the good things, if you want, about evolutionary spirituality. And so in my essay, I it's only a paragraph, but I say there are certain attractive to me aspects of evolutionary spirituality. Um, it's attractive to try and find, you know, a dialogue or, or harmony between um, the sciences and, and religion. 
and you know, of course, just to kind of to, to to see ways that they can talk to each other. Um, so that's that's interesting. It's also um, in some ways these these new forms of, of religious thinking are less. They can be less uh, fiercely dogmatic than older religions. They can they can be less homophobic, less misogynistic. Though I argue that sometimes still. Um, some forms of evolutionary spirituality can be prone to kind of class animus, can be prone to racism uh, and so on. So there, there are some issues with it. But um, I also, what I like about it is it, this is a kind of broad worldview that believes in human potential. That, you know, that, 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 that talks about humans' potential to self-actualize, to realize, to become more. And it also often has an exciting vision of the future of humanity. And, you know, as Europeans, I think, I don't know if you have ever felt this, Tom, sometimes European culture can be, it, it lacks sometimes an exciting vision of the future, the future of humanity. And one thing that attracts me to Californian culture with all its flaws, and, and California is often, I think, the kind of home or mecca of this type of evolutionary spirituality, is is they have an optimistic vision of the future, right? Uh, you know, long term vision of the future. What 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 humans might become in a thousand years or in a million years. So that's so so. There's lots that's interesting and attractive uh, uh, about this worldview, and I think it's it also often fits with an environmental and an ecological worldview. Right. But you know, you said worldview, a worldview by design is always a little bit arbitrary. You know, it could be different. There are different kind of worldviews that we can observe. And so yeah. even, even you could level some critique at the stages model, you know, that it's in itself a modernistic kind of way of structuring, you know, the mind and all of this while it's itself purporting to be beyond that. And but it's a construct in a kind of way, construct to believe uh, in. And sorry, mean, and, I'm sorry. On, and, yeah. and then there's the other thing, of course, that I wanted to mention that, that I was asking myself while reading your paper that, well, in a kind of sort of sense, it's, it's one of the building blocks of our Western civilization because you find this idea of ascending and transcending. You find it in early Christianity. You find it in the cults of Mithras. You find it in the Jacob's Ladder. You, you even find it today in politics and democratic progressivism and all, all these kinds of things where we think, oh, we bring democracy to other to other uh, cultures and, you know, our liberal uh -huh. leftist kind uh -huh. of worldviews are more advanced than those of the rednecks in, uh, in the basket uh -huh. of deplorables, famously said so by Hillary Clinton and so implying by that force that the liberal kind of worldview is more advanced than the from the people from the Bible Belt, right? And so, I understand. And so I understand you your own. point. You're kind of you're you're getting onto my critique of evolutionary right. spirituality. I haven't made a critique yet uh, in this conversation. Um, but so let me very very quickly outline the five critiques right. I make of it. Sure. Um, and then and then I'm going to get to your point about. Is is a set, the idea of ascendance or hierarchy essentially bad? Um, so what what I argue the, the main bulk of, of, of the essay is 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 suggesting that there are five um, tendencies um, or ethical tendencies which which I criticize in evolutionary spirituality. Um, five flaws which I don't think are necessarily essential. And at the end of the essay, I, I suggest ways that they could be met. Um, they are very briefly. Firstly, um, it can lead to spiritual narcissism that evolutionary spiritualities typically have an idea of a, um, a hierarchy of self-actualization in humans, that some humans are more evolved than others. Um, often the, 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 there's a kind of 5% that is that is kind of at the next stage of evolution. You right. get that idea in Wilbur, Abraham Maslow talks about only 5% of humans are really self-actualized. Um, so so there's, there, there's that kind of sense. And, and almost always people who believe in various different forms of evolutionary spirituality think they are in that uh, 5% or so that are at, at the kind of evolutionary peak. So um, 
the 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 issue there and i you know this is i know what you want to dive into but the issue there is that that's just leads to that can lead to a kind of um narcissism and right. an elitism which i don't think some some figures in this would not deny that it's elitist and say yes of course we are elitist but also it kind of you know it's unattractive kind of narcissism to think oh i'm i'm definitely part of the evolved elite um secondly and it kind of emerges straight from that there can be a tendency to look down on other groups or indeed on 99.5% of humanity as less evolved unactualized or even kind of unreal not fully human subhuman um and i give you know in all of these i give kind of quotes from leading figures in 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 the movement so like you know Nietzsche's comments about uh, the, you know, the, 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 the pointless superfluous masses or Aldous Huxley saying, you know, 99.5% of the human race is stupid and Philistine or Osho saying, you know, Rajneesh saying, um, you know, most of the human race are retarded. So there's, 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 you don't have to look far to find examples of that kind of contempt for the less evolved or unfit masses. Um, third is a tendency to spiritual Malthusianism, uh, which is that you should let the less fit or the less evolved die off so that the new can emerge, uh, so that the kind of the, 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 the new human can emerge. Fourth is a tendency to spiritual eugenics, the idea that maybe nature needs assistance in this and therefore these kinds of science, scientist priest class should um, make sure that the more evolved are breeding more and the less evolved are breeding less or not at all. Uh, and so I talk in that section just about how many uh, advocates for evolutionary spirituality supported eugenics in some form. And then finally, um, I talk about a tendency to kind of medical spiritual illiberal utopianism so about how figures like alexis carell aldous huxley gerald hurd abraham maslow often put forward kind of rather utopian visions of a new type of society which is geared towards self-actualization and geared towards the evolution of super beings and and how often that goal you know human rights and individual rights come second to that goal there we go. That's it. Right. Um, now, okay. I, can, I can go into your point if you want about the point you made earlier about isn't hierarchy always something. Do, I can talk about that if you want. Like, like is, is, isn't the idea of hierarchy pre-evolutionary and just pretty much essential and inescapable to most worldviews? Um, and this has been the kind of the response, the most common response I've got to, to my argument is, are you criticizing the idea of higher and lower entirely or better and worse? Uh, are you criticizing completely the idea of any kind of elite? Um, and I'm not. I agree with you that it's, it's basic to Western culture and basically to humanity to have this idea of people who are better or worse at a certain practice, for example. Right. Someone who is a master meditator and someone who's a, a beginner. Someone who's an advanced surfer and someone who's, who's just started. Uh, and, it's, and that is a fundamental idea to spiritual practice as well. Right. Uh, I'm going to go and learn from you because you've been doing this longer than me. Um, the idea of hierarchy is basic to Western civilization, as you say. It's, it's there in, in, in Plato. I am, I am you know, um, more realized than you. It's, it's, it's you know, I, I, have, I am, you know, even the idea that I'm a closer to God. So this, you know, this goes back to the idea of the divine hierarchy, which you get in Western mysticism. So I, yeah, that's, I, I agree, that's, that's pretty much unavoidable. Now, I think, and, and because that reason, every religion also has the possible tendency to narcissism. And you definitely see that in Christianity. Um, that Christians can sometimes think, well, we are the pure ones. 
and um, right. and you are and you are less pure. We are close to God, and you are impure uh, and, and 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 less valuable, less worthwhile. Now, but I when I argue in my article is that evolutionary spirituality has a greater tendency to that kind of elitism and narcissism for this reason that um, Christians, for example, think that they might be better than a non-Christian because they um, follow a certain kind of teaching whilst others don't. Same with Muslims. I am better than you because I obey Muhammad's law and you don't. Whilst followers of evolutionary spirituality, it's not a question of belief or of practice. It can be a question that I am essentially superior to you. I am biologically, spiritually, biologically right. superior to you. I am a higher being to you. I am a different species to you. And you see that that, I, to my mind, has, you know, like when, say, Abraham Maslow says 5% uh, of the human race are fully human and 95% of the race are not fully human. That, you know, Christians never say that. They never say right. that non-Christians are not fully human. They might well say they're not fully realized. They haven't realized their full capacity or potential. But I think that's, that's the difference. And then you can see that can play out in some dangerous ways, uh, particularly in, in eugenics, for example, that these people are just worth less. Uh, their lives are worth less because they are less evolved biologically essentially and um, these people are just essentially worth more therefore these people deserve less to live and these people deserve more to live so um and of course many you can have that kind of you can think you're a higher species a, a, an essentially high human without believing in eugenics but i'm but i'm just saying that quite i just point out in the article that quite often in the past, supporters of evolutionary spirituality did support forms of eugenics as well. So does that make sense? Sure. Sure. Of course. Okay. So that's my argument. So um, I mean, on that particular point, I don't have a problem with the idea of, like you're talking about in Sloterdijk, the idea of um, ascension, trying to be more, trying to be better. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, well, he talks about, he has like this wonderful concept of the uh, vertical tension that we need right. to orient ourselves in the world and in ourselves, you know, and to contend yeah. with the unknown, basically. Mm. And and to jump ahead, I mean, in the, in the, in the um, conclusion of the essay, I talk about how could these ethical limitations be minimized or avoided? And one of my suggestions comes from John Stuart Mill, who in some ways had a kind of quasi-evolutionary uh, philosophy of flourishing. Um, and he thought that humans could flourish more or less than other humans, so that some humans could have realized their potential more than other humans. But here's the crucial point. He didn't think there was just one hierarchy like Maslow did. Like just some humans, you know, there's, there's, there's one ladder and some humans are higher up the ladder and some are lower, you know, in that rather inflexible, dogmatic way. Rather, people like him and people like William James thought there are possibly multiple different ways you could self-actualize. In other words, multiple different kind of fitness landscapes, right. multiple peaks. Yeah, I, I think that's one way to think about it. So and also that what might look completely weird and pathological to some people might actually be its own weird fitness peak. Um, OK, so, so I think, oh, so, yeah, yeah, I would what I would and like then to we do, can talk. So Mill yeah. talked about like experiments in living and, and, you know, again, William James, William James was a pluralist. Uh, John Stuart Mill was a pluralist. So, right. so you can have a, a pluralistic idea of evolutionary spirituality and that might make you less inclined to point the finger at someone else and say, you are less evolved. And, right. you know, and instead to say, well, you might be, 
pursuing your own completely different fitness landscape. You're, you're, you might be climbing up a completely different path. Right. So there isn't necessarily one mountain. So what I would like to do is because you have highlighted five different aspects of problematic habits or thought processes or fallacies. And so what I would like to do for the purpose of this conversation to lump them in two groups. So I would like to talk about uh, uh, the biggie, uh, uh, narcissism, spiritual narcissism on one side, and then the four other ones because, well, because I have an issue with them. Let's say it like this. Because, um, I mean, we are all, in, in terms of narcissism, I think the issue is that Uh, we can all f fall prey to narcissism, right? And, and if, if you're spiritual or not, it's like independently where you are on these on these fitness landscapes and in, in the hierarchy. And then I think the problem with spirituality is that it that its goal is you know to transcend the ego, and therefore the whole thing with narcissism weighs even more when it when it happens, right? But I don't necessarily think that there is a greater majority of people within Uh, the group of evolutionary spiritual people uh, uh, that are, you know, more than in any other group, because I think it's like the distribution of narcissists is is, is equal, uh -huh. you know. Well, so okay, but 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 it weighs more because but because the intent of spirituality is to grow beyond ego and 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 habits and all of this. On the other side, the the group with the other four uh, uh, aspects. So my issue is that you uh, very precisely um, give the quotes of all these famous people in the past uh, w with their weird kind of conceptions and ideas about eugenics and whatnot. And I was thinking, yeah, maybe, but maybe that was like 50 years ago or 60 years ago, right? And so could, couldn't you make the argument that The, the new age and the evolutionary spirituality movement from the 60s and 70s onward was precisely that moment that got rid of all of these kind of things because you, you can't really make an argument today for eugenics or social Darwinism or like some illiberal views. You can't. And if you really look at it, it's because people were getting more into tune with psychology and philosophy and spirituality and Buddhism and were kind of like more you know, um, uh, sensitive and em em empathetic to all these people. So the argument could, couldn't the argument be made that it's, it's, it's the opposite around that spirituality did this for our culture, that we became more aware of the injustices. So on your first point, uh, that, that, that it's unfair to criticize evolutionary spirituality for, for, uh, a tendency to narcissism because narcissists are evenly distributed through the population. I mean, I think there's, 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 there's two things. There's the kind of psychological type of the malignant narcissist. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then there's kind of cultural narcissism, which is not necessarily emerging from a particular personality type, but perhaps comes from the tendency of a certain culture. Like you could say, I don't know, 18th century Paris, if you're in the aristocracy, might have a kind of tendency to, to narcissism, to thinking that they are the acme of world civilization, for example. Um, now, I agree that there is a tendency to elitism and narcissism in other religions as well. But my argument is that it's more so in evolutionary spirituality for cultural reasons, partly This is the, 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 the strong influence of Friedrich Nietzsche, who, um, you know, was just hugely influential on, on kind of on New Age spirituality and on modernists uh, on their generation, kind of 1920s to the 1940s and onwards, really. I mean, he's a big, big influence on transhumanism as well and so on. And he, um, other um, religions, tend to have this idea that, you know, we have God within us, but God is transcendent to us. Right. And that to properly worship God, we should kind of humble ourselves before God. So, so there's, there's, there's various ideas. God is transcendent to the human and more than human. Uh, and that it's appropriate for humans to, to have humility before God and also um, compassion 
for our fellow humans because we are all equal. I mean, not all religions believe this, but certainly, you know, the Abrahamic religions tend to think we are all equal in that we are all children of God. Evolutionary spirituality does not share that. First of all, it thinks um, on the whole that, um, you know, we, we become God. So there's, there's you know, and, and you find that in, in, in some forms of, it's, it's, you know, Gnostic Christianity, I suppose. But so there's more of a sense of rather than that God is transcendent to the human, that humans become God. So there can be a, a tendency to um, self-deification and self-worship. Secondly, um, Nietzsche and others very much rejected the idea of humility. They thought this was, you know, Nietzsche thought this was a slavish Christian false virtue. And that actually Christian, you know, humility was, was bullshit because Christians pretended to be humble, but they weren't really. So, um, so there tends to be, there can be a rejection of that. And you see that in New Age culture still. I am a god. I am a goddess. You know, you don't necessarily come across, you, you talk about, you know, there's, there's a bit of an idea of like, you know, be aware of your shadow, but not really much of a sense of humility as a virtue. This is part of the, the transition from post, you know, into a post-Christian culture. The idea of humility, mortification, self-abasement has, has, has diminished in Western culture. And... Nietzsche also rejected the idea of compassion and charity. Again, he thought this was a phony Christian virtue, which was bad for the species because we, 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 we kept alive people who shouldn't be kept alive, in essence. And so, um, again, there's, you know, there's a rejection of the old Christian ideas of charity, of duty, of service. And I think one can still see that a bit in New Age culture. Um, right which can lack the idea of charity, duty, service to others. Not always, but I've sometimes felt that. Um, that, that, that in some ways, Christian culture is a bit stronger than our culture in the kind of charity, duty, service department. I get your point, but you were talking about uh, family uh, resemblances in the beginning of our conversation, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And so you have, you have, of course, Nietzsche that you know, famously killed God or whatever, and yeah. um, putting this vertical tensions that we normally have outside of us, putting it into ourselves, you know, to become, you know, substituting God for the Übermensch. So the ideas to between yeah. that and let's say Peter Sloterdijk's vertical tension, that is very similar. Yes, I mean, I think, I, as, I don't know Sloterdijk's work very well, but it seems to be very Nietzschean. Right. No, we are all living. Um, yes. in, no, no. But my argument is, we are all living in Nietzsche's world. Uh huh. Well, I don't. I think. I think the idea that humans should strive to become godlike uh, is is not found outside of New Age culture. But the idea that God is dead and that the end of life is somehow the. Well, I mean, let me, let me, sorry. Let me put it this way. Expressive individualism, I think you're right, is the kind of water that we generally swim in now. So right. in that sense, we are children of Nietzsche. The idea that there's no God and instead there should be a kind of aesthetics of the self. Right. Um, I think that is the culture we swim in. So right. you're right that there is, and, and, and that also, I think, probably leads to a, an increased narcissism in general in Western culture. Yes. So I would agree with that. Yeah, because it's like, we are, I mean, we're both writers. And so you know what the, pro I, I always like this example because writing is such such a fractal kind of way of thinking about existence itself. So you, have, you start with writing because you have an idea and this idea is not very well thought out. And then you start to unfold that thought and you start to write and then you start to talk about those things. And what happened is that, that, that you're constantly putting a vertical tension onto yourself it's like oh no that's not it yet i have to clarify my arguments i have to be more precise while i'm doing that and so you're unfolding the self and this is like a very modernistic kind of nietzschean way of approaching the world because it's very modern i agree i don't i don't think that's necessarily problematic and and also it reminds me very much of um again i'm, I'm not an expert but it's um it reminds me of furbach 
Furbach, who talked about, you know, God is just a projection of the human. Right. And let's recognize that. And then it's about, you know, actualizing ourselves through work. Right. And trying to transcend ourselves through work. And, 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 and that was a big influence on, on Marx as well, early Marxism. And, and that, which is what you reminded me of just talking there, is that, that idea of self-realization, self-transcendence through work. Um, yes, I, don't, I, uh, I agree. I feel the same, you know, about my work or whatever it is, you know, like learning Spanish or trying to learn to surf. I love that, trying to get better at something. So, um, but I think that's... Um, that's that's different to thinking that I'm more evolved than ninety nine percent of the human race. Sure. Um, and so it's 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 just to point that out. And and like I, I often find it, I found it, you know, in my in my research on kind of evolutionary spirituality, it just it often struck me as kind of a bit ridiculous. For example, like you know, when Abraham Maslow was lecturing to um, a corporation in Silicon Valley, and he says you know, only 5% of the human race uh, achieves self-actualization. And I think that includes everyone in this room. Well, I mean, that's a great way to kind of, uh, you know, win over your corporate audience, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Or like there's a group called the Evolutionary Leaders. Um, it's still going and it includes people like, you know, Deepak Chopra. It used to include Barbara Marx Hubbard, who was a kind of very influential figure in this, in this movement. And I'm like, you know, what makes you think you're the evolutionary, evolutionary leaders? I mean, first right. of all, the idea that you're, you know, you're somehow leading evolution. What does that even mean? Even just the idea that you're in the elite of humanity. I mean, these are kind of, you know, on the whole, vapid life coaches. I mean, like, what makes them think they're, you know, even if you accept the idea of an elite of humanity, what makes these people think they're in it? <laughs> Um, yeah, because so, evolution itself is not a thing that actualizes itself, you know, in a linear kind of fashion. You know, you can a be very you can, important point. You, you, you can you can be a traditional Buddhist or Christian and advance, you know, the thinking and the arguments there in a in a completely valid kind of way. And so that's you know, and and so well, I, this is this is where I think there might, to, from to my point of view, this is why I don't subscribe to evolutionary spirituality even though I love spirituality more broadly configured, I just, I don't see the need to tie spirituality to evolution. Spirituality, we're talking about like, you know, 2000 year old practices and ideas. Evolution is, is, is you know, 150 year old theory. Um, and I, I, so I don't see either, you know, I think when you try to hoist them together, it it, it 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 ends up being morally dubious and scientifically illiterate because you know according to darwinian evolution there is no higher there is no better there's there's this branching out in multiple directions and fitter just means you survive you survive according to certain conditions it doesn't mean you're morally better it doesn't mean you're higher this was the point that um, Thomas Huxley, Aldous and Julian's grandfather, who was known as Darwin's bulldog, made at the end of his life in a, in a great essay called Evolution and Ethics. Um, earlier in his life, he talked about science as a kind of religion. He talked about nature and evolution as a moral teacher. But by the end of his life, he said, this was a mistake that, you know, um, what evolves is not necessarily more moral. It's just what adapts and survives according to, you know, and it might also just be to, according to fluke, you know, genetic drift or just random mutations. So I think you can believe in the idea of spiritual ascension without having to tie that to evolution. And I think people historically have because they want to give credibility and authority to their spiritual beliefs and worldview. But I think people, those spiritual beliefs and worldview have much more credibility and authority from their, you know, the fact that for 2000 years, people have practiced them and they've, and it's led to more flourishing in their lives. So I, I you know, I don't see the need to kind of, to tie your, 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 your cart to the horse of evolutionary theory. Okay. But can, can, can't you make the argument that, that it's, 
the other way around that you shouldn't because i mean you could you could go with piaget right and so you have the development of children and you 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 can clearly say that you know a child of four years or five years has a more advanced kind of cognitive processing than that of a two-year-old what you never would do in that instance is to do a value judgment right uh -huh. so uh -huh. and so and because that would be the fallacy to to say the four-year-old the five-year-old would be better than the two-year-old but then you have uh -huh. like adult developmental theories that build on piaget that says okay there's there are stages of cognitive development that you can measure you know uh cook reuter and and terry fallon and all these people that kind of have a scientific outset for measuring you know stages of complexity and 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 moral values and stuff like this and but that doesn't make them better people that doesn't okay. that doesn't uh i mean how do you see that how do you approach these kinds of theories okay well i because i know that there's been a big old argument in the last couple of years within uh you know the world of integral theory and metamodernism about stage theories and whether they're essentially right. illiberal and i know like you know nora bateson has talked about that at, um you know i i've i've spoken to her and i i, I quote her in this in this essay um i I I don't have a problem with psychologists trying to put forward models of human development and arguing that there are stages of human development and it's useful to think like that. Um I think when they when these um psychological theories also become quasi you know spiritual movements right there is a risk to uh, of 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 narcissism which I think many former followers of Wilbur have talked about, like Mark Mason and Jamie Wheel, both of whom I quoted my piece, talk about there can be a tendency among Wilburites to be a bit puffed up, like we're this stage and everyone else is the other stage. But, mm. um, you know, so what, right? Okay, I mean, like, um, it's not a big deal. So, that, so, so some Wilburites are puffed up, you know, big deal. Um, where I think where I think it, it gets dangerously illiberal is if those kinds of stage theories about who is more or less fully human or fully realized um, become part of public policy. Right. Um, and now that might sound, you know, and that's what happened when eugenics became um, massively popular was that theories of, you know, more or less human more or less fully human, more or less fully realized, um, became part of public policy and 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 governments and, and scientists um, suddenly were given this massive power and authority to say you're less than fully human, you don't have the right to read or you don't have the right to live. Um, and I mean, this 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 gets to my my fifth criticism, which is the risk of illiberal spiritual medical utopias. When when you get like um, scientist priests, um, you know, and this was one of the critiques of eugenics. Like Alfred Russell Wallace said that eugenics creates a kind of meddling new priestcraft. The the father of eugenics, Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin said eugenics is a new religion and he was the new kind of prophet of this new religion this was the first new evolutionary religion he said and it made eugenicist doctors into a kind of new priests and they would go around preaching the gospel he called it the jihad of eugenics they would preach the gospel of it um and they 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 in some countries got terrible power awful power to say who is more or less human, who deserves more or less to live. Now, this also happened after World War II. It, amazingly, it didn't end with, with Nazism. So, uh, for example, um, Abraham Maslow put forward his, um, you know, stage theory of, of human development. Um, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy, 
Uh, and, you know, at the top is the 5% who is self-actualized. He thought only 5% reached that stage of being fully human in his phrase. And um, the mass of society in his phrase is the dead weight. And he privately wrote papers in the 60s saying that, um, you know, that in the future, reproduction would need to be regulated that you couldn't just let anyone reproduce, that there should be a kind of um, global body of, of um, medical wise men who decree who does and doesn't get to reproduce. Mm. And he even said that we shouldn't, you know, he even entertained the possibilities of like, um, that the truly unfit shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, allowed to live. So that was in the late 60s, he was writing that. He couldn't say it publicly, but he, was, he wrote a paper which he read out privately at the Salk Institute in, um, in California. If you look at Osho, uh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, he was saying the same thing publicly, that he thought that um, all global reproduction should be regulated. Again, that there should be this, um, you know, a, a body that decides who does and doesn't get to live, who does and doesn't get to reproduce. Um, Aldous Huxley in the 50s and early 60s was still um, preaching eugenics uh, in his talks on human potential and saying that, you know, in the future, um, societies would, um, you know, the, 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 the regulation, sorry, reproduction would be much more scientifically managed. But um, I, let, let me just jump in, Jules, because uh, yeah. I was asking you 10 minutes ago, like a question pertaining to, to this very point, because, um, yes, they said that for we can make up some reasons why they said that, um, which would be an interesting discussion. But then again, that doesn't happen right now. So the spiritual community doesn't really advocate for eugenics right now. And uh -huh. you could make the argument that is because you know, the New Age movement and all these kinds of theories help people to be more sensitive? Well, I think it's true that spirituality now is much more diverse. And, you know, there are parts of it that are much more uh, social justice oriented. And they tend to be the parts that are much more concerned about the reemergence of eugenics. Right. Um, so I think I would take your point there that the spirituality today is 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 is, is more diverse and and uh, so on. Um, though I think it still does have you know so so yes perhaps this is you know in some ways this is a you know this is a kind of I don't think the risk of eugenics is is nearly as strong now of spiritual eugenics. This is the phrase I use is nearly as strong now as it was in the 20s and 30s. Right. In a way, I, I just wanted to make my point in this essay, like it hadn't really been written about much. Right. No, no one had yet written about the fact that so many figures in the history of New Age culture had been in support of um, some form of eugenics. And right. I, I wanted to just make that point. Okay, what, what I think uh, is happening today within this broad landscape of evolutionary spirituality, I do think there is a reemergence of eugenics, but in a different form. Uh -huh. um, I don't think we're seeing now so much the kind of top-down authoritarian eugenics that you saw in the United States and in Germany and in other countries, uh, particularly in the kind of 20s and 30s and 40s, where basically governments rule who it, who can and can't reproduce or even who can and can't live. What we see now through new genetic technologies is what some have called like liberal eugenics. So you get, for example, some transhumanists who follow the lead that Timothy Leary uh, kind of uh, forged in the 1970s. Um, so in the 1970s, Leary said um, he was in when he was in prison in Folsom Prison uh, in 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 uh, the early 70s. 
And he wrote, he started writing books saying, okay, here's, um, we've reached the next stage of human evolution. A few special humans are about to blast off into space. And out in space, they're going to create a new civilization. And they are going to use new technologies, including like psychedelics and also genetic modification. And they're going to become a super species. Uh, he called it SMILE. This stood for, oh, let's see if I can remember Space this. Space migration, uh, intelligence increase, and uh, life, life extension. Life extension. Thanks a lot. Um, so th there's going to be this new super race, which would be uh, live a lot longer, be a lot smarter, be a lot happier, and, and more actualized. They would have, you know, this is the final stage in his eight-stage circuit. So he had a kind of whole stage theory of human development. Um, and in the 1980s and 90s and today, um, people, particularly in California, got quite into Leary's vision. And you had different movements like the extropians. Have you come across them? So this was people like, uh, a lot of them now are quite active in the world of AI and AI risk. It was it was a mailing. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? It was it was a, a mail group. Is that what they're called? A mailing, mailing list. list. Yes. Yeah. It was a '90s mailing list, very small, and it, they were they were transhumanist and they were often Nietzschean. Extropian meant to become more, more than human. It was incredibly influential. This mailing list. It included like Nick Bostrom who went on to become a kind of leading transhumanist philosopher. Eliza Yudkowsky, who went on to become the kind of father of rationalism, and he's a big figure in AI risk today. It included the founder of WikiLeaks. What's Assange. his name again? Julian yeah, Assange. Julian Assange. Oh, wow. it included the founders of cryptocurrency, uh, three of the most important figures, probably one of whom invented Bitcoin. Like, uh, I can't remember their names either. Um, so it was a really influential, interesting group of people. Anyway, and they got very into Leary's idea of, um, we have the right to modify our minds and our genes and just leave us alone and let us do it. And if government gets in the way, then we're going to leave Western societies and we're going to form our own transhumanist libertarian utopia. Either offshore, we're going to create like a free topia island, or, you know, and Peter Thiel was very into this idea, like seasteading, or off world. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to go to Mars or somewhere else. <clears throat> and, and this, and there was, you know, that, there, were, there were other kind of, um, you know, transhumanists who got very into this idea. It then got adopted by some of the richest people on the planet. So people like Elon Musk, um, people like uh, Jeff Bezos, um, Zuckerberg, uh, Peter Thiel, Christian Angermeyer. They, it's now kind of quite commonly accepted. Timothy Leary's madcap vision is now very commonly accepted in Silicon Valley that um, humans or some humans are going to become superhumans and that it's more likely to happen off world. Um, so Christian Angermeyer, for example, who's a German, who's the leading investor in psychedelics, and he's, he co-invests with Peter Thiel. He said he thinks the human race is going to bifurcate. Some humans are going to go offshore and genetically modify themselves and become superhumans. And some humans are going to go, that's not for me, that's freaky, <clears throat> and they'll become an alternate species. So this is, this is the new type of eugenics that's happening now. Um, it's kind of libertarian eugenics, not right. top-down government-imposed, but instead groups of people saying, I have the right to genetically modify, and just you governments just back off, don't tell me what to do, and if you tell me what to do, I'm going to go into space and do it there. This presents us with a different set of moral questions to 1920s-style eugenics. Um, I think the different moral questions are, 
Well, you, you can understand. There's all kinds of like, for example, is this safe if certain people go off and start genetically modifying in their garage or offshore or off world? Um, what are the risks to the human race of this? Right. Secondly, there's questions about equity. What if genetic, all the benefits of the new genetic advances get hoarded by the super rich and, and, and aren't available to the general population? Um, there's another investor in Silicon Valley um, called um, Sean Parker, who founded Napster and then was one of the first investors in Facebook. And he said, if you think health inequality is bad now, wait till you have a class of billionaires who are living to 200 or 300. Uh, and he called it with his tongue in cheek and rather provocatively, he called it, there'll be a new class of immortal overlords. So, you know, if, if there is this sudden leap forward in, in, in genetic technologies, but it's only available to the super rich. There is a risk of health inequalities being massively um, worse within 10 or 20 years. Right. So, I mean, I remember I wrote about Alistair Crowley right. and, uh, and the Golden Dawn and they, um, their attitude to eugenics. Um, so many, um, several members of the Golden Door were also men, members of the Eugenic Society. <clears throat> and they, they had this idea that the Golden Dawn um, was a kind of order to uh, help the evolution of humanity, right. to create kind of super beings. But there was also often a liberal aspect to that. The super beings would somehow, you know, <clears throat> be more powerful than the, the ordinary crappy humans. But, um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, they... Good, yes, the I, same with this Institute for the Harmonious Development of Men. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and they also had this, they had very interesting ideas, the Golden Dawn, about, you know, uh, occult eugenics. They thought that, you know, with certain kind of spells or processes or rituals, they would create super babies. Uh, and that's what Crowley writes about in his book, Moonchild. Right. It's what Jack Parsons was trying to do uh, with the, what's it called? The Babylon working. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, and what WB Yeats was trying to do. So that's a bit of a nerdy <clears throat> side angle. Um, so, uh, but, you know, sometimes it's, I remember when someone responded when I said, oh, look, the Golden Dawn were into eugenics, and sometimes that's a liberal. Someone said, look, Crowley, and, the, you know, they could say the same about Timothy Leary. He was provocative. He was, he was you know, saying things. <clears throat> Don't take him too literally. That's fine. I don't, I'm fine with that. I, I'm fine with accepting, for example, that Timothy Leary was a provocateur. He really was. And, you know, when he says, for example, in one of his books in the 70s, well, you know, Hitler was kind of a visionary. He was being provocative in a way that could just about work in the 70s, but it can work much less well today. All I would say is that some, you know, what happens when one of these scientist priests gets political power? Right. It rarely happens. But what happens if Abraham Maslow actually got political power or if he actually influenced public policy? Because sometimes scientific theories and psychological theories become public policy and influence public policy. And then I think it is a risk when you have these theories. But isn't that happening at right now? Anyhow? I mean, you have like all these people, this Protestant kind of Democrats that have like a very religious outset and world frame. And, yes. and it's like we're not, it's like if you look at the landscapes of politicians that we have now in Germany, what happened in Britain the last year, it's like, yeah. what, what, what's, what's happening with the grand elder statesmen, you know? Uh, ab absolutely. There, there are all kinds of different religious and scientific theories that can influence public policy. And right now, you know, I don't exactly see evolutionary spirituality as being a major influence on public policy. Right. So in some ways I'm warning about things which are not, you know, major issues right now. If you look at the States, the, the major issue right now is, you know, the kind of Christian right going after abortion rights and so on or, right. or, or other kinds of things. Okay. But 
There's one exception there, uh, or two, two exceptions, where these kinds of theories are influencing public policy in very clear ways. One is on AI and AI risk and how we should, you know, treat um, the possible emergence of kind of higher intelligence. Uh, and there you have, you know, I, I've argued that, that you know, that transhumanists have a kind of worship for the possible of AI superintelligence. And, and you know, anyway, so they, 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 there's all kinds of religious thinking around, around kind of AI and the emergence of higher intelligence. And it can be, I think it can, it can be risky in two ways. It can be risky in terms of being fanatically for it and the, seeing this as basically the culmination of human destiny and therefore just let it happen. Or it can be fanatically against it, where you see this as an apocalyptic threat to humanity and therefore it must be stopped completely. So that's one area where I see what some of what we're talking about playing out in public policy. The other area is around um, genetic modification. Um, one of the people I interviewed in my work is a couple called um, Malcolm and Simone Collins. Uh, and they are the first couple to publicly admit to having used genetic modification technologies to choose a particular embryo for their child according to certain mental scores. What I'm saying is Malcolm and Simone, they were the first to use a specific technology, which was um, embryonic selection according to mental scores. Anyway, and they also are kind of transhumanists. So they also, um, they, they developed their own religion, which is basically that instead of God, they have their, their, their divine descendants. They worship their divine descendants, these kind of super beings who will, will come in, in a few generations. Um, all I'm saying is, I think we need to think about this new type of liberal eugenics and, and you know, that it raises certain ethical issues and, and, and that some of these kind of evolutionary spirituality, I, I'm suggesting that evolutionary spirituality, as we go into a new genetic era, which we're barely talking about really now, and we're not really, it's not very much on our cultural radar, I would say, but it's going to be more and more. And I wonder if forms of genetic spirituality, genetic religion will, well, let, let me put it this way. I wonder how this new genetic revolution will affect our spirituality and reflect, affect our religious worldviews. Mm. Um, I'm not saying it's, I am not anti-technology and I'm not even, I'm not even anti-genetic modification. Uh, I think it's, in, in, in the essay, I, I end up arguing for kind of democratic transhumanism, which is the, the goal of transhumanism, which is humans kind of evolving in certain directions, should not be the province only of the super rich. That this goal needs to be communicated, you know, this idea, this worldview needs to be communicated more widely <clears throat> to humanity. Because at the moment, there's a kind of anti-transhumanist backlash in, in conspiracy culture. The, 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 right. the present, one of the most popular, you know, bogeymen in conspiracy culture is transhumanism at the moment. And I don't think transhumanism is necessarily all bad. I don't think, you know, the idea that of new, te new technologies helping humans develop in new ways, I don't think that's all bad. All I'm saying, Tom, to come back to your point, your original point was, why are you talking about eugenics? Why are you talking about spiritual eugenics? That was all in the past. And I've given a rather long-winded answer to say, no, it's, it's, it's very much... The, why You go onto Twitter and type in eugenics and see how much we're arguing about it today. 
And the reason we're arguing about it today is partly we're arguing about the past, but we're also arguing about the future because we're about to go into this new, this brave new world where parents will be able to choose what kind of baby they have. Right. And I do not yet personally have a strong moral philosophical position on um, the virtues or vices of this brave new world. But I think we should start thinking about it a lot more and that it is a kind of new liberal eugenic um, era that we're going into. Fantastic, Jules. That was a long and very precise and very good answer. I thank you for your time <laughs> in doing this. Yes, thanks for thanks for thanks for reading the essay, Tom. And it, you know, it was a, it was a pleasure to talk can, with someone who's thinking about similar topics. Is that uh, available on your website, or where do people find that uh, article? Uh, yeah, it's it's open access. It's on the the essay is on Frontiers. It's called "More Evolved Than You." Um, if people are interested, uh, I also have a Substack which is called ecstaticintegration.substack.com. That's a weekly newsletter. It's mainly about um, psychedelic and ecstatic integration. Um, I also, if they're interested in my writing on spiritual eugenics and the history of that, a lot of that's on Medium. So if they just Google spiritual eugenics, they'll find um, some of my essays about the Golden Dawn or Timothy Leary right. or right. Abraham Maslow or some of the people that we've talked about. 